Hi everyone, it's been a while and today I'll be reading on the Bill of Rights and if you're not a subscribed to our channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button below and let's study together. Thanks! From 2019 Golden Notes, Police Power Police power is the power of the state to promote public welfare by restraining and regulating the use of liberty and property. It is the most pervasive, the least limitable, and the most demanding of the three fundamental powers of the state. As an inherent attribute of sovereignty, which virtually extends to all public needs, police power grants a wide panoply of instruments through which the state, as parents patriae, gives effect to a host of its regulatory powers. We have held that the power to regulate means the power to protect foster, promote, preserve, and control with due regard for the interests first and foremost of the public, then of the utility of its patrons. Girl Chivers' Department of Energy, GR 159796. The state, in order to promote general welfare, may interfere with personal liberty, with property, and with business and occupations. Persons may be subjected to all kinds of restraint and burdens in order to secure the general comfort, health, and prosperity of the state and to this fundamental aim of our government. The rights of the individuals are subordinated. Ortigas and Company Limited Partnership versus Fiat Bank and Trust, December 14, 1979. Generally, Police power extends to all the great public needs. Its particular aspects, however, are the following. Public health, public morals, public safety, and public welfare. Requisites for a valid exercise of police power. 1. Lawful subject. The interest of the public generally, as it distinguished from those of a particular class, require the exercise of the police power and to lawful means the means employed are reasonably necessary for the accomplishment of the purpose and not unduly oppressive upon individuals ntc versus philippine veterans bank 192 square 257 question president rodrigo duterte issued proclamation number 475 formally declaring a state of calamity in Boracay and ordering its closure for six months. On account of this, Boracay residents Mark Anthony Sabal and Thi Ting Jacozalem filed the present petition alleging that they would suffer grave and irreparable damage as their livelihood depends on the tourist activities therein. They attack the order on the ground that it is an invalid exercise of legislative powers. Is the order invalid? No. That the assailed governmental measure in this case is within the scope of police power cannot be disputed. Verily, the statutes from which the said measure draws authority and the constitutional provisions which serve as its framework are primarily concerned with the environment and health, safety, and well-being of the people, the promotion and securing of which are clearly legitimate objectives of governmental efforts and regulations. The only question now is whether the temporary closure of Boracay as a tourist destination for six months reasonably necessary under the circumstances. The answer is in the affirmative. Tourists' arrival in the island were clearly far from than Boracay could handle. Certainly, the closure of Boracay, albeit temporarily, gave the island its much-needed breeder and likewise afforded the government the necessary leeway in its rehabilitation program. Note that apart from review, evaluation, and amendment of relevant policies, the bulk of the rehabilitation activities involve inspection, testing, demolition, relocation, and construction. These works could not have easily been done with tourists present. The rehabilitation works in the first place were not simple, superficial, 
or mere cosmetic, but rather quite complicated, major and permanent in character as they were intended to serve as long-term solutions to the problem. Sabal versus Duterte, GR 2384-67. Question hotel and motel operators in Manila sought to declare Ordinance 4670 as unconstitutional for being unreasonable, thus violative of the due process clause. The ordinance requires the clients of hotels, motels, and lodging house to fill out a prescribed form in a lobby, open to public view and in the presence of the owner, manager, or duly authorized representative of such hotel, motel, or lodging house. The same law provides that the premises and facilities of such hotels, motels, and lodging houses would be open for inspection either by the city mayor or the chief of police or their duly authorized representatives. It increased their annual license fees as well. Is the ordinance constitutional? Yes. The mantle of protection associated with the due process guarantee does not cover the hotel and motel operators. This particular manifestation of a police power measure being specifically aimed to safeguard public morals, is immune from such imputation of nullity resting purely on conjecture and unsupported by anything of substance. To hold otherwise would be to unduly restrict and narrow the scope of police power, which has been properly characterized as the most essential, insistent, and the least limitable of powers, extending as it does to all the great public needs. There is no question that the challenged ordinance was precisely enacted to minimize certain practices hurtful to public morals. The challenged ordinance then proposes to check the clandestine harboring of transients and guests of these establishments by requiring these transients and guests to fill up a registration form prepared for the purpose in a lobby open to public view at all times and by introducing several other amendatory provisions calculated to shatter the privacy that characterizes the registration of transients and guests. Moreover, the increase in the license fees was intended to discourage establishments of the kind from operating for a purpose other than legal, and at the same time to increase the income of the city government. Ermita Malata Hotel vs. City Mayor of Manila, GRL 24693. Q. The City of Manila enacted Ordinance Number 7774 entitled An Ordinance Prohibiting Short Time Admission, Short Time Admission Rates, and Wash Up Rate Schemes in Hotels, Motels, Inns, Lodging Houses, Pension Houses, and Similar Establishment in the City of Manila. The purpose of the ordinance is to prohibit motel and inn operators from offering short-time admission as well as prorated or wash-up rates for abbreviated stays. Is the ordinance a valid exercise of police power? Answer is no. A reasonable relation must exist between the purposes of the measure and the means employed for its accomplishment. For even under the guise of protecting the public interest, Personal rights and those pertaining to private property will not be permitted to be arbitrarily invaded. It must also be evident that no other alternative for the accomplishment of the purpose less intrusive of private rights can work. In the present case, there is less intrusive measure which can be employed, such as curbing out the prostitution and drug use through active police force. The ordinance has a lawful purpose but does not have the lawful means, hence unconstitutional. White Light Corporation versus City of Manila, GR122846, January 20, 2009. Q. Are the rates to be charged by utilities like Moralco subject to state regulation? Yes. The regulation of rates to be charged by public utilities is founded upon the police powers of the state and statutes prescribing rules for the control and regulation of public utilities are a valid exercise thereof. When private property is used for a public purpose and is affected 
with public interest, it ceases to be juris privati only and becomes subject to regulation. The regulation is to promote the common good. As long as use of the property is continued, the same is subject to public regulation. Republic versus Manila Electric Company, GR 141314, November 15, 2002. Note, mall owners and operators cannot be validly compelled to provide free parking to their customers because requiring them to provide free parking space to their customers is beyond the scope of police powers. It unreasonably restricts the right to use property for business purposes and amounts to confiscation of property. OSG versus Ayala Land, 600 Scra, 617, September 18, 2009. It was asked in 2014 bar. Requisites for the valid exercise of police power by the delegate. One, express grant by law. Two, must not be contrary to law. And three, GR, general rule within territorial limits of LGUs, exception, when exercised to protect water supply. Wilson versus City of Mountain Lake Terraces, 417, page P, 2D, 632, August 18, 1966. The courts cannot interfere with the exercise of police power. If the legislature decides to act, the choice of measures or remedies lies within its exclusive discretion as long as the requisites for a valid exercise of police power have been complied with. Can MMDA exercise police power? No. The MMDA cannot exercise police powers since its powers are limited to the formulation, coordination, regulation, implementation, preparation, management, monitoring, setting of policies, installing a system, and administration. Nothing in RA 7924 granted the MMDA police power, let alone legislative power. MMDA versus Track Works, GR 179554, 2009. Eminent Domain, Power of Eminent Domain. The power of eminent domain is the inherent right of the state to condemn private property to public use upon payment of just compensation. It is well settled that eminent domain is an inherent power of the state that need not be granted even by the fundamental law, Republic versus Tagle, December 2, 1998. The power of the nation or the sovereign state to take or to authorize the taking of private property for public use without the owner's consent Conditioned upon payment of just compensation. Barangay Sindalan, San, Fran San Fernando, Pampanga v. CA. GR 150640, March 22, 2007. Conditions for the exercise of the police power of eminent domain. Your mnemonics here is T U C O 2 CO. T taking of private property for public use, U. C, just compensation, and O, observance of due process. Note, there must be a valid offer to buy the property in refusal of said offer. Power of expropriation as exercised by Congress versus power of expropriation as exercised by delegates. Power of expropriation as exercised by Congress as to scope. The power is pervasive and all-encompassing. It can reach every form of property which may be needed by the state for public use. In fact, it can reach even private property already dedicated to public use or even property already devoted to religious worship. Barlin versus Ramirez. As to question of necessity, political question. Now, Power of expropriation is exercised by delegates as to scope. It can only be brought as the enabling law and the conferring authorities want it to be. As to question of necessity, judicial question. The courts can determine whether there is genuine necessity for its exercise as well as the value of the property. Requisites for a valid taking. 
One, the expropriator must enter a private property. Two, entry must be for more than a momentary period. Three, entry must be under warrant or color of legal authority. And fourth, property must be devoted to public use or otherwise informally appropriated or injuriously affected. And fifth, utilization of property must be in such a way as to host the owner and deprive him of beneficial enjoyment of the property. Republic versus De Castelvi, GRL 2620, August 15, 1974. Nature of property taken. General rule, all private property capable of ownership, including services, can be taken. Exceptions, A, money, and B, choices in action. Personal right, not reduced in possession, but recovered by a suit at law such as right to receive, demand or recover death, demand or damages on a cause of action ex contractu, or for a tort or omission of duty. Note, a choice in action is a property right in something intangible or which is not in one's possession, but enforceable through legal or court action, that is, cash a right of action in tort or breach of contract, an entitlement to cash refund, checks, money, salaries, insurance, claims. Requisites before an LGU can exercise a minute domain. An ordinance is enacted by the local legislative council authorizing the local chief executive in behalf of the LGU to exercise the power of eminent domain or pursue expropriation proceedings over a particular private property. 2. The power of eminent domain is exercised for public use, purpose, or welfare, or for the benefit of the poor and the landless. 3. There is payment of just compensation. And 4. A valid and definite offer has been previously made to the owner of the property sought to be expropriated, but said offer was not accepted. Municipality of Paranaque versus VM Realty Corporation 292 Squaw 678 July 20, 1998. Expansive concept of public use. Public use does not necessarily mean use by the public at large. Whatever may be beneficially employed for the general welfare satisfies the requirement. Moreover, that only few people benefit from the expropriation does not diminish its public use character because the notion of public use now includes the broader notion of indirect public benefit or advantage. Manuska versus CAGR 166440, January 29, 1996. Concept of vicarious benefit abandons the traditional concept number of actual beneficiaries determines public purpose, public use now includes the broader notion of indirect public advantage, that is, conversion of a slum area into a model housing community, urban land reform and housing. There is a vicarious advantage to the society. Field Stream International Incorporated versus CA 284 Squaw 716, January 23, 1998. Q. The Republic, through the Office of the Solicitor General, instituted a complaint for expropriation of a piece of land in Taguig, alleging that the National Historical Institute declared said land as a National Historical Landmark because it was the site of the birth of Felix Manalo, the founder of Iglesia Ni Cristo. The Republic filed an action to expropriate the land. Petitioners argue that the expropriation was not for a public purpose. Is this correct? Yes. Public use should not be restricted to the traditional uses. It has been held that places invested with unusual historical interests is a public use for which the power of eminent domain may be authorized. The purpose in setting up the marker is essentially to recognize the distinctive contribution of the late Felix Manalo to the culture of the Philippines, rather than to commemorate his foundation and leadership of the Iglesia de Cristo. The practical reality that greater benefit may be derived by members of the Iglesia de Cristo 
than by most others could well be true but such a peculiar advantage still remains to be merely incidental and secondary in nature indeed that only a few would actually benefit from the expropriation of property does not necessarily diminish the essence and character of public use manuska versus ca supra just compensation it is the full and fair equivalent of the property taken from the private owner owner's loss by the expropriator it is usually the fair market value or fmv of the property and must include consequential damages damages to the other interests of the owner attributed to the expropriation minus consequential benefits increase in the value of other interests attributed to new use of the former property no to be just the compensation must be paid on time 2009 bar fair market value fmv the price that may be agreed upon by parties who are willing but are not compelled to enter into a contract of sale seat of manila versus estrada period to determine just compensation general rule reckoning point as determined at the date of the filing of the complaint for eminent domain exception where the filing of the complaint occurs after the actual taking of the property and the owner would be given undue incremental advantages arising from the use to which the government devotes the property expropriated just compensation is determined as of the date of the taking npc versus cagr number 113194 march 11 1996 consequential damages consist of injuries directly caused by the residue of the private property taken by reason of expropriation chris and chris constitutional law 2015 edition q spouses salvador owns a land where a one-story building is erected the said land is subject to expropriation wherein the dpwh shall construct the NLEX extension exiting MacArthur Highway. DPWH paid the spouses amounting to 685000 which was the fair market value of the land and buildings. RTC issued a writ of possession in favor of the Republic, but decided to pay an additional amount corresponding to the capital gains tax paid by the spouses. The Republic, represented by DPWH, contested the decision of the RTC adding the capital gains as consequential damages on the part of the spouse of Salvador. Is the decision of the RTC correct? No. Just compensation is defined as the full and fair equivalent of the property sought to be expropriated. The measure is not the taker's gain, but the owner's loss. The compensation to be just must be fair not only to the owner, but also to the taker consequential damages are only awarded if as a result of the expropriation the remaining property of the owner suffers from an impairment or decrease in value in this case no evidence was submitted to prove any impairment or decrease in value of the subject property as a result of the expropriation more significantly given that the payment of capital gains tax on the transfer of the subject property has no effect on the increase or decrease in value of the remaining property it can hardly be considered as consequential damages that may be awarded to respondents republic versus spouses salvador gr 205428 june 7 2017 consequential benefits if the remainder is a result of the expropriation placed in a better location such as fronting a street where it used to be an interior lot, the owner will enjoy consequential benefits, which should be deducted from the consequential damages. From the Book of Cruz. Note, if the consequential benefits exceed the consequential damages, these items should be disregarded altogether as the basic value of the property should be paid in every case. Rule 67, Section 6 of the Rules of Court. Form of Payment general rule compensation is to be paid in money exception in cases involving carp compensation may be in bonds or stocks for it has been held as a non-traditional exercise of the power of eminent domain it is not an ordinary expropriation where only a specific property of 
relatively limited area is sought to be taken by the state from its owner for a specific and perhaps local purpose. It is rather a revolutionary kind of expropriation. Association of Small Land Owners in the Philippines Incorporated versus Secretary of Agrarian Reform. And let's take a quick break. Make sure that you are subscribed to our channel. If you're not yet subscribed to our channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. It really makes me feel good about myself and about you. Thanks. Note, the owner is entitled to the payment of interest from the time of taking until just compensation is actually paid to him. Taxes paid by him from the time of the taking until the transfer of title, which can only be done after actual payment of just compensation, during which he did not enjoy any beneficial use of the property, are reimbursable by the expropriator. Pursuant to Banco Central Nang Pilipina Circular No. 7990 of 2013 from July 1, 2013 onwards, and until full payment, an interest rate of 6% per annum should be used in computing the just compensation. One Bank of the Philippines versus Hababag, GR number 172352, September 16, 2015. Another note, the right to recover just compensation is enshrined in no less than our Bill of Rights, which states in clear and categorical language, that private property shall not be taken for public use without just compensation. This constitutional mandate cannot be defeated by statutory prescription. NPC versus Pausus Bernardo, GR number 189-127, April 25, 2012, asked in 2014, bar. Role of the Judiciary The value of the property must be determined either at the time of taking or filing of the complaint, whichever comes first. EPSA v. July, GR number 59603, April 29, 1987. In cases where property is not wholly expropriated, the consequential damages of the remaining property shall be added in the fair market value minus the consequential benefits. But in no case will the consequential benefits exceed the consequential damages. What is the effect of delay? General rule, no payment by the government does not entitle private owners to recover possession of the property because expropriation is an in rem proceeding, not an ordinary sale, but only entitle them to demand payment of the fair market value of the property exception. When there is deliberate refusal to pay just compensation in two, government's failure to pay compensation within five years from the finality of the judgment in the expropriation proceedings, this is in connection with the principle that the government cannot keep the property and dishonor the judgment. Republic v. Slim, GR, number 161656, June 29, 2005. Abandonment of intended use and right of repurchase. Question. Several parcels of land located in Lahug, Cebu City, were the subject of expropriation proceedings filed by the government for the expansion and improvement of the Lahug Airport. The RTC rendered judgment in favor of the government and ordered the latter to pay the landowners the fair market value of the land. The landowners received the payment. The other dissatisfied landowners appealed, pending appeal. The Air Transportation Office, ATO, proposed a compromise settlement whereby the owners of the lots affected by the expropriation proceedings would either not appeal or withdraw their respective appeal in consideration of a commitment that the expropriated lots would be resold at the price they were expropriated in the event that the ATO would abandon the Lahug Airport pursuant to an established policy involving similar cases. Because of this promise, the landowners did not pursue their appeal. Thereafter, the lot was transferred and registered in the name of the government. The projected improvement and expansion plan of the old Lahug Airport, however, was not pursued. From the date of the institution of the expropriation proceedings up to the present, the public purpose of the said expropriation, expansion of the airport, was never actually initiated, realized, or implemented. 
this, the landowners initiated a complaint for the recovery of possession and reconveyance of ownership of the lands based on the compromise agreement they entered into with the ATO. Do the former owners have the right to redeem the property? Yes. It is well settled that the taking of private property by the government's power of eminent domain is subject to two mandatory requirements, that it is for a particular public purpose and two, that just compensation be paid to the property owner. These requirements partake of the nature of implied conditions that should be complied with to enable the condemn or to keep the property expropriated. More particularly, with respect to the element of public use, the expropriator should commit to use the property pursuant to the purpose stated in the petition for expropriation filed, failing which, it should file another petition for the new purpose. If not, it is then incumbent upon the expropriator to return the said property to its private owner if the latter desires to reacquire the same. Otherwise, the judgment of expropriation suffers an intrinsic flaw, as it would lack one indispensable element for the proper exercise of the power of eminent domain, namely, the particular public purpose for which the property will be devoted. Accordingly, the private property owner would be denied due process of law, and the judgment would violate the property owner's right to justice, fairness, and equity. MIAA and Air Transportation Office versus Losada, GR 1766-25, February 25, 2010. Note, to continue with the expropriation proceedings, despite the definite cessation of the public purpose of the project, would result in the rendition of an invalid judgment in favor of the expropriator due to the absence of the essential element of public use. Republic versus Ears of Bourbon, GR 165-354, January 12, 2015. Taxation. It is the process by which the government, through its legislative branch, imposes and collects revenues to defray the necessary expenses of the government and to be able to carry out, in particular, any and all projects that are supposed to be for the common good. Simply put, taxation is the method by which these contributions are exacted. The power to tax includes the power to destroy only if it is used as a valid implement of the police power in discouraging and, in effect, ultimately prohibiting certain things or enterprises inimical to public welfare. But where the power to tax is used solely for the purpose of raising revenues, the modern view is that it cannot be allowed to confiscate or destroy. If this is sought to be done, the tax may be successfully attacked as an inordinate and unconstitutional exercise of the discretion that is usually vested exclusively in the legislature in ascertaining the amount of tax. Rojas v. CDA, GR No. L25043, April 26, 1968. Taxes are enforced proportional contributions from persons and property levied by the state by virtue of its sovereignty for the support of the government and for public needs. Note, payment of taxes is an obligation based on law and not on contract. It is a duty imposed upon the individual by the mere fact of his membership in the body politic and his enjoyment of the benefits available from such membership. Except only in the case of Paul, community taxes, non-payment of a tax may be the subject of criminal prosecution and punishment. The accused cannot invoke the prohibition against imprisonment for debt, as taxes are not considered debts. Scope of Legislative Discretion in the Exercise of Taxation Whether to impose tax in the first place, 2. Whom or what to tax, 3. For what public purpose, and 4. Amount or rate of tax. General Limitations on the Power of Taxation Letter A. Inherent Limitations under which we have uh, public purpose, to non-delegability of power, three, territoriality of or status of taxation, four, exemption of government from taxation, and five, international committee. 
Letter B, constitutional limitations. One, due process of law. Article 3, Section 1. Equal protection clause. Article 3, Section 1. Uniformity, equitability, and progressive system of taxation. Article 6, Section 28. Non-impairment of contracts. Article 3, Section 10. Non-imprisonment for non-payment of poll tax. Article 3, Section 20. Revenue and tariff bills must originate in the House of Representatives, Article 4, Section 24. Non-infringement of religious freedom, Article 3, Section 4. Delegation of legislative authority to the President to fix tariff rates, import and export quotas, tonnage and wharfage dues. Tax exemption of properties actually directly and exclusively used for religious, charitable, and educational purposes, NIRC Section 30. Majority vote of all the members of Congress required in case of legislative grant of tax exemptions. Non-impairment of Supreme Court's jurisdiction in tax cases. Tax exemption of revenues and assets of including grants, endowments, donations, or contributions to educational institutions, Article 6 of the 1987 Constitution, Section 28, Number 3. Notice and hearing in the enactment of tax laws. From the procedural viewpoint, due process does not require previous notice and hearing before a law prescribing fixed or specific taxes on certain articles may be enacted. But where the tax to be collected is to be based on the value of taxable property, the taxpayer is entitled to be notified of the assessment proceedings and to be heard therein on the correct valuation to be given the property. Uniformity in taxation. It refers to geographical uniformity, meaning it operates with the same force and effect in every place where the subject of it is found. General rule, the power to tax operates with the same force and effect in every place where the subject of it is found. This is known as geographical uniformity. Exception, the rule on uniformity does not prohibit classification for purposes of taxation provided the requisites for valid classification are met. Ormuk Sugar v. Treasure of Ormuk, February 15, 2013. Progressive system of taxation. It persists that the tax rate increases as the tax base increases. Double taxation. It means taxing the same property twice when it should be taxed only once. That is, taxing the same person twice by the same jurisdiction for the same thing. It is obnoxious when the taxpayer is taxed twice when it should be but once. Otherwise, described as direct duplicate taxation. The two taxes must be imposed on the same subject matter for the same purpose by the same taxing authority within the same jurisdiction during the same taxing period and the taxes must be of the same kind or character. City of Manila versus Coca-Cola Butler's Philippines GR number 181845, August 4, 2009. Tax Treaties in negotiating tax treaties, the underlying rationale for reducing the tax rate is that the Philippines will give up a part of the tax in the expectation that the tax given up for this particular investment is not taxed by the other country. In order to eliminate double taxation, a tax treaty resorts to several methods. First, it sets out the respective rights to tax of the state of source or situs and of the state of residence with regard to certain classes of income or capital. Second, whenever the tax of source is given a full or limited right to tax together with the state of residence, the treaties make it incumbent upon the state of residence to allow relief in order to avoid double taxation. Commissioner of Internal Revenue versus Supreme S.C. Johnson and Sons. June 25, 1999. Two tax laws or ordinances constitute double taxation when they tax. Your mnemonics here is PUPS JK. P for the same purpose. A by the same taxing authority. P for the same taxing period. S on the same subject matter with the same taxing jurisdiction for J. 
and K of the same kind or character. Swedish match Philippines versus Treasure of the City of Manila, GR 181277, July 3, 2013. Tax exemptions may either be 1. Constitutional or 2. Statutory. Note, requisites for constitutional exemption, actual, direct, and exclusive use by the following. Educational, charitable institutions, and religious organizations. And note, for statutory, it has to be passed by a majority of all the members of the Congress. Article 6, 1987 Constitution. Revocability of tax exemptions. 1. Exemption is granted gratuitously, revocable, and... 2. Exemption is granted for valuable consideration, non-impairment of contracts, irrevocable. Construction of tax laws. In case of doubt, tax statutes are to be construed strictly against the government and liberally in favor of the taxpayer. For taxes, being burdens are not to be presumed beyond what the applicable statute expressly and clearly declares. CIR versus La Tondena Incorporated and CDA. Construction of laws granting tax exemptions. It must be strictly construed against the taxpayer because the law frowns on exemption from taxation. Hence, an exempting provision should be construed strictly semi juries. Acting Commissioner of Customs versus Manila Electric Company, GR number 23623, June 30, 1977. What is tax versus license fee? Tax is levied in exercise of the taxing power by a license fee imposed in the exercise of the police power of the state. The purpose of the tax is to generate revenue under tax and under license fee. License fees are imposed for regulatory purposes, which means that it must only be of sufficient amount to include expenses in issuing a license, cost of necessary inspection or police surveillance. Its primary purpose is to generate revenue and regulation is merely incidental under tax. For license fee, regulation is the primary purpose. The fact that incidental revenue is also obtained does not make the imposition a tax, still a license fee. Note, ordinarily, license fees are in the nature of the exercise of police power because they are in the form of regulation by the state and considered as a manner of paying off administration costs. However, if the license fee is higher than the cost of regulating, then it becomes a form of taxation. Armita Malado Hotel versus City of, um, City of Manila Mayor, GRL. 24693 October 23 1967 Now question can taxes be subject to offsetting or compensation the answer is no taxes cannot be subject to compensation for the simple reason that the government and the taxpayer are not creditors and debtors of each other there is a material distinction between a tax and a debt debts are due to the government in its corporate capacity while taxes are due to the government in its sovereign capacity it must be noted that a distinguishing feature of tax is that it is compulsory rather than a matter of bargain. Hence, a tax does not depend upon the consent of the taxpayer. Felix Mining Corporation v. CIR 294 Squa 687 Private Acts and the Bill of Rights Bill of Rights Sets of Prescriptions setting forth the fundamental civil and political rights of the individual and imposing limitations on the power of government as a means of securing the enjoyment of those rights. The Bill of Rights governs the relationship between the individual and the state. Its concern is not the relation between private individuals. What it does is to declare some forbidden zones in the private sphere inaccessible to any power holder. People vs. Marty, GR 81561, January 18, 1991. The Bill of Rights cannot be invoked against private individuals. In the absence of governmental interference, the liberties guaranteed by the Constitution cannot be invoked. The equal protection erects no shield against private conduct, however discriminatory or wrongful. 
Ira Segi versus Paul, GR 16881, October 17, 2008. Note, however, where the husband invoked his right to privacy of communication and correspondence against a private individual, his wife, who had forcibly taken from his cabinet documents and private correspondence and presented as evidence against him, the Supreme Court held, these papers are inadmissible in evidence upholding the husband's right to privacy. Sulueta v. C.A. G.R. 107383, February 29, 1996. Right to life, liberty, and property, meaning of life. The right to life is not merely a right to the preservation of life, but also to the security of the limbs and organs of the human body against any unlawful harm. This constitutional guarantee includes the right of an individual to pursue a lawful calling or occupation, to express, write, or even paint his ideas for as long as he does not unlawfully transgress the rights of others, to exercise his freedom of choice, whether this is in the area of politics, religion, marriage, philosophy, and employment, or even in the planning of his family and in general to do and perform any lawful act or activity which, in his judgment, will make his life worth living. Suarez Book, 2016 Meaning of Liberty It is not only the right of a citizen to be free from the mere physical restraint of his person, as by incarceration, but the term is deemed to embrace the right of the citizen to be free in the engagement of all his faculties, to be free to use them in all lawful ways. Alligators v. Luciana, 165 U.S. 578, January 6, 1897. Wow. Meaning of property. It refers to things which are susceptible of appropriation and which are already possessed and found in the possession of man. Due Process Clause No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall any person be denied the equal protection of the laws. As Article 3, Section 1, Due Process means there shall be a law prescribing harmony with the general powers of the legislature. It shall be reasonable in its operation. It shall be enforced according to the regular methods of procedure prescribed, and it shall be applicable alike to all citizens of the state or to all of a class, people versus kayat. The purpose, the due process clause, is a guarantee against any kind of abuse and arbitrariness by anyone in any of the branches of government. More specifically, the purpose of the Due Process Clause is to prevent undue encroachment against the life, liberty, and property of individuals, to secure the individual from any arbitrary exercise of powers of government, unrestrained by the established principles of private rights and distributive justice, three, protect property from confiscation by legislative enactments, from seizure, forfeiture, and destruction without a trial and conviction by the ordinary modes of judicial procedure. Kinds of due process, we have procedural due process and substantive due process. Substantive due process purpose. This serves as a restriction on the government's law and rule-making powers. Procedural due process purpose serves as a restriction on actions of judicial and quasi-judicial agencies of the government. As to requisites on the substantive due process, the interest of the public in general, as distinguished from those of a particular class, require the intervention of the state. Number two, the means employed are reasonably necessary for the accomplishment of the purpose and not unduly oppressive upon individuals. On their procedural due process, one, impartial court or tribunal cloth with judicial power to hear and determine the matters before it, to jurisdiction properly acquired over the person of the defendant and over property, which is the subject matter of the proceedings, three, opportunity to be heard, four, judgment rendered upon lawful hearing and based on evidence adduced. Substantive due process requires the intrinsic validity of the law in interfering with the rights of a person to his life liberty, or property. 
If a law is invoked to take away one's life, liberty, or property, the more specific concern of substantive due process is not to find out whether said law is being enforced in accordance with procedural formalities, but whether the said law is a proper exercise of legislative power. Note, publication of laws is part of substantive due process. It is a rule of law that before a person may be bound by law, he must be officially and specifically informed of its contents. For the publication requirement, laws refer to all statutes, including those of local application and private laws. This does not cover internal regulations issued by administrative agencies, which are governed by the local government code. Publication must be full or there is none at all. Tanyara v. Tubera, GRL 63915, December 29, 1986. Question. The City of Manila enacted Ordinance 7783, which prohibited the establishment or operations of business, providing certain forms of amusement, entertainment, services, and facilities where women are used as tools in entertainment and which tend to disturb the community among the inhabitants and adversely affect the social and moral welfare of community. Owners and operators concerned were given three months to wind up their operations or to transfer to any place outside their mid and mulatto area or convert said business to other kinds of business which are allowed. Does the ordinance violate the due process clause? Yes. These lawful establishments may only be regulated. They cannot be prohibited from carrying on their business. This is a sweeping exercise of police power, which amounts to interference into personal and private rights, which the court will not countenance. There is a clear invasion of personal or property rights, personal in the case of those individuals desiring of owning, operating, and patronizing these motels and property in terms of investment made in the salaries to be paid to those who are employed therein. If the city of Manila decided to put an end to prostitution, fornication, and other social ills, it can instead impose reasonable regulations such as daily inspections of the establishments for any violation of the condition of their licenses or permits. It may exercise its authority to suspend or evoke their permits. It may exercise its authority to suspend or revoke their license for these violations. And it may even impose increased license fees. City of Manila v. Laguiao, Jr. GR 118127, April 12, 2005. Procedural due process. It is the aspect of due process which serves as a restriction on actions of judicial and quasi-judicial agencies of the government. It refers to the method and manner by which a law is enforced. The fundamental elements of procedural due process are the following. 1. Notice to be meaningful must be as to time and place. 2. Opportunity to be, to be heard. 3. Court or tribunal must have jurisdiction. Due process in extradition proceedings. Um, see extradition section under public international law for discussion. Question. A complaint was filed against respondent Camille Gonzalez, then chief librarian, catalog division of the National Library for dishonesty, grave misconduct, and conduct prejudicial to the best interests of the service. The DEX investigating committee was created to inquire into the charges against Gonzalez. Is she entitled to be informed of the findings and recommendations of the investigating committee? No. It must be stressed that the disputed investigation report is an internal communication between the DEX secretary and the investigation committee, and it is not generally intended for the perusal of respondent or any other person for that matter, except the DEX secretary. She is entitled only to the administrative decision based on substantial evidence made of record and a reasonable opportunity to meet the charges 
and the evidence presented against her during the hearings of the investigation committee. Bifian Ko v. Mural, TR 132248, January 19, 2000. Question. Cadet 1CL Kudia was a member of C Club Diwa class of 2014 of the PMA. Professor Birong issued a delinquency report against Cadet Kudia because he was late for two minutes in his class. Kudia reasoned out that I came directly from OR 432 class. We were dismissed a bit late by our instructor, sir. The company tactical officer, CDO of Cadet Kudia, penalized him with the merits. Kudia addressed his request for reconsideration to his senior tactical officer, but the senior tactical officer sustained the penalty. The company tactical officer reported him to the PMA Honors Committee for a violation of the Honor Code. When the members of the Honor Code casted their votes through secret balloting, the result was 8 and 1 in favor of guilty verdict. After further deliberation, the presiding officer announced the 9-0 guilty verdict. Kudia contested the dismissal as being violative of his right to due process. Was the dismissal of Kudia a denial of his right of due process or his right to due process? No. Due process in disciplinary cases involving students does not entail proceedings and hearings similar to those prescribed for actions and proceedings in courts of justice. That the proceedings may be summary, that the cross-examination is not an essential part of the investigation or hearing, and that the required proof in a student disciplinary action, which is an administrative case, is neither proof beyond reasonable doubt nor preponderance of evidence, but only substantial evidence or such relevant evidence as a reasonable mind might accept as adequate to support a conclusion. What is crucial is that official action must meet minimum standards of fairness to the individual, which generally encompass the right of adequate notice and meaningful opportunity to be heard. It is not required that procedural due process be afforded at every stage of developing disciplinary action. What is required is that an adequate hearing be held before the final act of dismissal. Kudia v. Superintendent of the PMA, TR 211362, February 24, 2015. Constitutional due process protects the individual from the government and assures him of his rights in criminal, civil, or administrative proceedings. Statutory due process, while found in the Labor Code and Implementing Rules, it protects employees from being unjustly terminated without just cause after notice and hearing. Agabon v. NLRC, TR number 158693, November 17, 2004. Note, the Bill of Rights is not meant to be invoked against acts of private individuals like employers. Private actions, no matter how egregious, cannot violate constitutional due process. Effect when due process is not observed. The cardinal precept is that where there is a violation of basic constitutional rights, courts are ousted from their jurisdiction. The violation of a party's right to due process raises a serious jurisdictional issue which cannot be glossed over or disregarded at will. Where the denial of the fundamental right to due process is apparent, a decision rendered in this regard, of that right is void for lack of jurisdiction. This rule is equally true in quasi-judicial and administrative proceedings. For the constitutional guarantee that no man shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process is unqualified by the type of proceedings, whether judicial or administrative, where he stands to lose the same. Garcia versus Molina and Velasco GR 157383 and 174137. Q. In a dispute involving mining claims, Apple Cements Corporation wished to take over 
mining claims of certain areas that overlapped with the portions of the claims of Mingson Mining Industries Corporation. The case was eventually brought to the Panel of Arbitrators, or POW, and they uphold a resolution in favor of Apple Cement without requiring the parties to file pleadings. Mingson brought the case to the DNR Mining Arbitration Board, or MAB, stating that due process was not accorded to the party. When the case was brought to the CA, it affirmed that MAB's decision. Is the CA correct in upholding MAB's decision finding that Mingson was not afforded its right to due process? Yes. Implementing rules of the Philippine Mining Act of 1995 clearly require that the parties involved in a mining dispute be given the opportunity to be heard. In this case, it has been established that the POA proceeded to resolve the present mining dispute without affording either party any fair and reasonable opportunity to be heard in violation of some of the provisions of DENR. Hence, Mingson's due process rights were violated, thereby rendering the POA's decision null and void. Apple Cement v. Mingson Mining, TR 206728, November 12, 2014. What is the effect of waiver or estoppel? Due process is satisfied when the parties are afforded a fair and reasonable opportunity to explain their respective sides of the controversy. Thus, when the parties seeking due process was in fact given several opportunities to be heard, can air his side, but it is by his own fault or choice he squanders these chances, then his cry for due process must fail. Q. A formal charge was issued against DPWH officials and BAC members for awarding the subject project to an unregistered contractor which was not in the list of DPWH Notarial Registry of Civil Works contractors who could beat. DPWH officials and BAC members were asked to answer the issuance but denied answering and our duty was not their duty to know if a contractor is registered since they were not made to comment prior to or during the preliminary of fact finding investigation they argue that it violated their right to administrative due process is there a violation against their right to administrative due process no they expressly waived their rights to a formal hearing when they denied answering the issue ones given to them in administrative proceedings, where opportunity to be heard either through oral arguments or pleadings is accorded, there is no denial of procedural due process. Ib Dane v. Aprilio, GR 204172, December 9, 2015. What is relativity of due process? Relativity of due process arises when the definition of due process has been left to the best judgment of our judiciary, considering the peculiarity and the circumstances of each case. In the litany of cases that have been decided in this jurisdiction, the common requirement to be able to conform to due process is fair play, respect for justice, and respect for the better rights of others. In accordance with the standards of due process, any court at any particular time will be well guided instead of being merely confined strictly to a precise definition which may be or may not apply in every case. Not all situations calling for procedural safeguards call for the same kind of procedure. This requires a reasonable degree of flexibility in applying procedural due process. A determination of the precise nature of the government function involved, as well as the private interest that has been affected by governmental action must be considered in determining the application of the rules of procedure. Cafeteria and Restaurant Workers Union v. Mac Ilroy, 367 U.S. 886. To say that the concept of due process is flexible does not mean that judges are at large to apply it to any and all relationships. Its flexibility is in its scope 
once it has been determined that some process is due. It is a recognition that not all situations calling for procedural safeguards for the same kind of procedure. Morrissey v. Brewer, 408 U.S. 471, June 29, 1972. Whether in civil or criminal judicial proceedings, due process require that there be, one, an impartial and disinterested court cloth with law, with authority to hear and determine the matter before it, note, the test of impartiality is whether the judge's intervention tends to prevent the proper presentation of the case or the ascertainment of the truth. Number two, jurisdiction lawfully acquired over the defendant or the property which is the subject matter of the proceeding. Three, notice and opportunity to be heard be given to the defendant. And four, judgment to be rendered after lawful hearing clearly explained as to the factual and legal basis, and that's in Article 7, 1987 Constitution. Administrative and Judicial Due Process Essence, under administrative, opportunity to explain one side. Under judicial, a day in court means under administrative usually through seeking a reconsideration of the ruling or the action taken or appeal to a superior authority under judicial submission of pleadings and oral arguments as to notice in hearing under administrative it is required when the administrative body is exercising quasi judicial function field com sat versus alquas gr 84818, December 18, 1989. Under judicial, both are essential. Notice and hearing. Due process in academic and disciplinary proceedings. Parties are bound by the rules governing academic requirements and standards of behavior prescribed by the educational institution. Resort to court is available to parties. Vivaris and Susara versus St. Therese College, DR 20266, September 29, 2014. Due process in deporting proceedings. Although a deportation proceeding does not partake of the nature of a criminal action, however, considering that it is a harsh and an extraordinary administrative proceeding affecting the freedom and liberty of a person, the constitutional right of such person to due process should not be denied. Thus, the provisions of the rules of court of the Philippines, particularly on criminal procedure, are applicable to deportation proceedings. Laugi v. CAGR 81789, December 29, 1989. Scheer, a German, was granted permanent resident status in the country. In a letter, Vice Consul Hippelin informed the Philippine ambassador to Germany that the respondent had police records and financial liabilities in Germany. The Board of Commissioners, or BOC, thereafter issued a summary deportation order. It relied on the correspondence from the German Vice Consul on its speculation that it was unlikely that the German Embassy will issue a new passport to the respondent. On the warrant of arrest issued by the District Court of Germany against the respondent for insurance fraud and on the alleged illegal activities of the respondent in Palawan, the BOC concluded that the respondent was not only an undocumented but an undesirable alien as well. Is the summary deportation order valid? No. Section 37, letter C of Commonwealth Act number 613, as amended, provides that no alien shall be deported without being informed of the specific grounds for deportation or without being given a hearing under rules of procedure to be prescribed by the Commissioner of Immigration. Under paragraph 4 and 5 of the Office Memorandum Order, number 34, an alien cannot be deported unless he is given a chance to be heard in a full deportation hearing with the right to adduce evidence in his behalf. The respondent was not afforded any hearing at all. The BOC simply concluded that the respondent committed insurance fraud and illegal activities in Palawan without any evidence. The respondent was not afforded a chance to refute the charges he cannot thus be arrested and deported without due process of law as required by the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. Domingo v. Scheer, GR 1547, 
four five, January twenty nine, two thousand and four.